Hi, my name is Mankan McGann. Donc, je veux lire un partie de, de ce livre, de ce livre que j'ai publié l'année dernière. Et il s'agit de, de la langue irlandaise. Um, en avant, je veux, je veux aussi remercier l'Alliance française de m'avoir donné cette opportunité de, de lire. Alors, on commence. I'm going to start right at the beginning. Kaleidoscope. It was my grandmother, Sheila Humphreys, who taught me Irish. And when I asked her one day what the word for a hole was, she replied, Do you mean one dug into the ground by an animal? That's an uchus. Or one made by fish in a sandy riverbed for spawning? That's a sehar. Or if it's been hollowed out by the hooves of beasts and then filled with rain, it's a plobon. Or if a lobster is hiding in one, it's a fach. Or if it's been created as a hideaway by a wild beast, it's a puhish. That was the moment that I realised that the two languages I spoke, Irish and English, required not just different forms of grammar and syntax, but different ways of seeing the world. I had already noticed that when giving directions, I had to orientate myself very differently, depending on the language. In Irish, I had to take account of the position of the sun. I couldn't say I was heading up the road or back to someone's house or into town. Instead, I would first situate myself in relation to the planet. I would be heading Shiro Yas, southwest, along the road, or Adoig, to the north, or Sir Avalia, eastwards home. Even when someone or something was just a little way off, such as a cow in the next field, I would say, Tanvo Her Safark, the cow is in the field to the east. Later on, I learned that there were many other words for holes, such as one dug in a bog, a kshihar, or one made by an auger, a tarahar, and a cup-like hole in a rock, a balon. Lug is a water-filled hole in the landscape, kro, a hole in the eye of a needle, and spail, a hole in the stern of a boat. Bjefna, a tiny hole made by an insect or a needle, has its direct opposite in duvachoin, a hole so big that it can be classed as an abyss. Push, shape, sluch, cluish, and lugon are all other possibilities, some more specific than others. Each can be translated into the English word hole. Now, perhaps it's efficient to do so, but I've always wondered what subtlety and nuance is lost, and whether the richness of the reality the Irish words describe would wane. Our landscape now looks like an increasingly anonymous expanse of indistinguishable fields. Yet, seen through the Irish language, each field has its own word, depending on its characteristics and function. Gower, Bánog, Bioroch, Machara, Boila, Ingletus, Dumusach, Pokin, Fasach, Mónair, Cahidin, Reg, Quivran, Redlin, Cluin, Mean, Taunach, Budan, Tur, Bramar. Plas, Rayan, Loshta, Quilin, Railog, Kavan, Acha, Mohar, Plasog, Loscon, Park, Mog. To a city dweller, this land may all look the same. And in English, each would probably be just referred to as field. Yet to someone whose ancestors have been cultivating the land, growing grain and tending cattle for over 4,000 years, and who have built up the soil over centuries by hauling seaweed from the shore and burning limestone, limestone to add alkalinity. They look very different. Gower is a field of corn grass. Bjoroch is a marshy field. Bronner is a fallow field. Quiveren is a tilled field worked in partnership with a neighbour. Thur and night fields for cattle. Cloyne is a meadow field between two woods. Taunoch an arable field in an arid area. Reblin is a field for games or dancing. Plas a level field for spreading flax or hay. Plasog a sheltered field in which a mare would foal. Rayan an upland field. Machara a low-lying open field. Boile is a field for keeping cattle before milking. Malnair is an enclosed field. Reg a level field. Mean a smooth fine field. And Reilog an unenclosed patch of good land in the middle of a craig, a stonier area of limestone. Kairin is a field with a fairy dwelling. Lusset, a neat, well-arranged field, is similar to Kulin, which is also neat but smaller. 
Each of these words summon particular swathes of our landscape and the activities that happen in them. Some words even refer to fields in which something occasionally happened but no longer does, such as Balnog, a patch of ground levelled out by years of dancing, among, other, among a few other things, or Budal, a hillside that once had gorse growing on it but has since been cut with a scythe or a hook, leaving only stumps. A hillside on which the gorse has been removed not by cutting but by burning is a Luscom. Having lived here for so long, we have perhaps inevitably become rooted in every aspect of this land, becoming entangled in its complex network of clay, sand, stone, weeds, worms, microbacteria, flora, pollinators and mycelium. But I hadn't realised how far back this connection stretched until my grandmother taught me a shanukal, a proverb, literally old word, that took my sense of time and space so much, that shook, sorry, my, my, my sense of, of time and space so much that I'm still contending with it today. Sail three veal void, sail umida of all. Sail three umida, sail on thou one. That was what she said to me. Sail three veal void, sail umida of all. Sail three umida, sail on thou one. These words, meaning three times the life of a whale, is the lifespan of a ridge, and three times the life of a ridge is the lifespan of the world, and they mean a growing ridge. Encapsulating just how far back the knowledge contained within the language stretches on on this island. A whale, you see, was thought to live for 1,000 years, although they actually lived for about a century. So it was known that the cultivation ridges that we see in the fields around us could be up to 3,000 years old. Archaeologists agree that they are indeed ridges on this, of this age still in places such as the Cade Fields in Mayo and Schlieff Moor on Ackle Island. The span of three cultivation ridges would amount to 9,000 years, which takes us back to the time where archaeologists believe significant number of humans first settled here, the beginning of our world. That our people appear to have kept account of how long we've been here, and that they encoded it into our language, is really precious. My grandmother often pointed out to the still visible cultivation ridges left by her great-grandparents' generation during the famine in the 1840s. Some were more visible than others, as they had been left undug. My ancestors either were too weak to dig them, or, having noticed the blight-rotted potato stems, had realised that there was nothing but a slimy mush beneath the soil. I had been struck by the longevity of such memories. But it wasn't until I heard the proverb that I realised quite how far back these folk memories stretch. It appears as though we as though we managed to keep some wispy thread of memory intact from our Neolithic forebears, who planted, weeded and harvested along such ridges thousands of years ago. The knowledge is contained within the land, and over the years I've realised that the best way to access it, access it is through the language. Okay, I'm going to read you a bit from the centre of the book. Um, From, hopefully, page 138. Yeah. The most direct, this is a chapter called Place Names. And as we said, I'm Moncon McGahan. The most direct and visceral way the Irish language is connected to landscape is through place names. While the, local, while the local names for fields, hills, hollows, rocks, cliffs, trails and summits are enriching, it is the names of the 60,000 townlands that truly reveal the world around us. Many of them are like koans, paradoxical riddles without a clear solution. They offer tantalising hints and encoded reflections on our culture, our psyche and the past practices that are becoming gradually less decipherable every year. There are glimpses into the historical, geographical and anecdotal qualities of our past just waiting to be revealed by those who understand the code. And now, with online resources, any of us can, with a little patience, begin to unpack them just as one might unpack the pellets of a barn owl and to reveal the husk and hairs and bone fragments within. 
By seeing beyond the archaic terminology and rare grammatical constructions, we can get tantalising insights into our ancestors' lives, their knowledge of the environment and their folk belief. It is in its anglicised form, Baal, uh, Baal and Abriskan in County Mayo means nothing, Baal and Abriskan. But Baal Aha and Abriskan means the settlement of the ford of the wild Tansy. Suddenly, an unassuming spot on a back road from Kong to Clare Morris becomes a meadow, rich with flat-topped yellow flowers smelling of camphor and rosemary. Images of the annual gathering of Tansy that would have taken place here over centuries or even millennia are conjured up, with local people harvesting the plants to use throughout the year as a cure for joint pain and as a wrapping for meat since its toxic compounds repel insects and maggots. A place like Bell on the Briskin would have received more covert night visits by women in distress, as tansy has long been used to induce miscarriages when taken in high doses. Just south of the village of Adair in County Limerick is Nach Fierne, which was Knoch Rhin Fierne, Don's Hill of Truth. The name sparks curiosity. And further burrowing reveals that this was the power centre of Dun, or Down, a brother of Amergin, the druid whose incantation propelled our world into being. He was therefore also an uncle of Conal Cairnach, but you'd read about him in a, in, a, in a previous chapter. It's said that Down drowned with the rest of Amergin's family, trying to reach the coastline, but was later resurrected as king of the Munster fairies. He chose Nachfirna for the site of his palace, but from where he was able to rule over the rolling meadows of County Limerick, and he, he's buried there in a massive rock cairn at the summit. Local people will tell you the truth, Fearn, referred to in the place name, concerns the accurate weather predictions that certain residents of the area claim to make by gauging the appearance of the hill. But in fact, it's connected to the deeper and more serious truth of life and death represented by Downs or Dunn's other persona, King of the Dead. The sight of his white horses galloping by on stormy nights meant they were about to face the ultimate truth, that you were about to face, sorry, the ultimate truth of your mortality. Each place name is like a periscope, offering a view to another world or another era. Carig Nanonchoch, Carig Anonsoch in County Waterford, means the rock of the foolish women. I could speculate to its meaning, but the mystery of its ambiguity is actually more appealing. In County Mayo, there's a little in inlet in Killary Harbour with a name simply too evocative to even attempt to decipher. Cúnín Ashgiorgahifran, or in English, Cúnín Ashgiorgahifran, which translates as the little harbour going back to hell, or skidding back to hell, really. It's hard to gauge what gets lost when we can no longer decipher these names. But does it matter really that most people in Ballypit Maeve in County Antrim no longer know that they live in the townland of Queen Maeve's Vulva, Baila Fitta Maeve? Or that they live or that those living in Shikinarinki in County Tipperary may not know that their thornbush, Shekin on Rinka, which was ideal for dancing, translates as the little thorn bush of dancing. How much value is there in knowing that Lis Farabug and the Mon in County Clare derives from Lis Farabug and the Gabon, the fairy fort of the small men of the Hurleys? Or that Loch Dirina the Vodia in County Cork derives from Loch Dirin Undavo Yeag, Little Oakwood, Lake of the Twelve Cows? Or what about Cusin the Rin the Walig in County Kerry, which derives from Cus Rin on Eon Walig? The cove of the point of the solitary ras. Why was there just one ras? Ras is like a type of rockfish. And what did this solitary rockfish do to attain immortality in, in a place name? The truth is that over the course of millennia, we have developed these terms as our we have developed these terms as our way of relating to our surroundings. P. W. Joyce referred to it in The Origin and History of Irish Place Names in 1870 as a great name system begun thousands of years ago by the first wave of population that reached our island. It continued unceasingly from age to age till it, 
embrace the minutest features of our country in its intricate network. And such as it sprang forth from the minds of our ancestors, it exists almost unchanged to this day. Seeing the Stoic promontories stretching out into the sea like giant skulls, we call them cligan, head or skull, and the term survives in Hiberno-English as cleggan. In the Midlands, those dark, black, sullen realms of spongy sphagnum mire that vacillate between solid and liquid were labelled bogoch, meaning soft, which gave us the English word bog. The long ridges of post-glacial gravel that rose above the bogs was called esker, which is the origin, origin of the term esker. In our place names, the country is almost entirely described through Irish. Over 90% of the names have their origin in the Irish language, and a significant number of those are from the 7th century, according to Donald Mokwila Aspig, from the former Chief Place Names Officer at the Department of Community Equality and Gwaltzacht Affairs. As P.W. Joyce noted, in our island, there was scarcely any admixture of races till the introduction of the important, the important English element, chiefly within the last 300 years. And accordingly, our place names are purely Celtic. The land comes alive through its place names, in a way that we cannot speak Irish, in a way that those who cannot speak Irish will not perceive. All of this is who we are at our, at our base level. The, the memories are encoded within the language and it's up to us to reveal it, to uncover it. Machin Shine, that's, that's about it. That's just a little flavour of two chapters of 32 words for fields. What's the subtitle? Lost Words of the Irish Language. Again, I'd really like to thank the Alliance Francaise for giving me this opportunity for sharing a little bit of my work. Merci et à la prochaine.